Hello and welcome to Lucid Mind Chemistry channel with Majid. In this video, I'll be solving Chemistry O Levels Multiple Choice, paper 12 from May June 2021. You can go to any particular question by following timestamps given in the video description. Let's start. Question 1 The formula of magnesium oxide can be investigated by using the fact that when magnesium is heated, it reacts with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. Which apparatus is used for this investigation? The formula can be obtained from masses of magnesium and oxygen that combine together. So for masses, we must have balance. And as magnesium is heated in oxygen, it forms magnesium oxide, so therefore as this is strong heating, the crucible must also be present. We have magnesium, oxygen from air, both will react together to form MgO, magnesium oxide. We can find the initial mass of magnesium before reaction and then final mass of magnesium oxide solid. We can subtract these two masses to find the mass of oxygen that is required for this reaction. So therefore gas syringe is not needed. As part 2 and 3 are correct, answer is therefore D. Question 2. Which property of a liquid ester can be used to check its purity before using as a food flavoring? Now, purity of a liquid can be checked by its boiling point. You should always remember that pure substance always has fixed boiling point. Other properties like color, smell, and solubility, it does not show whether the substance is pure or impure. So the correct answer is part A. Question 3. Which separation method would give pure samples of both substances from the mixture? The mixture is of copper sulfate crystals in water and the separation method is crystallization. From crystallization, we can remove some of the solid of copper sulfate in the form of crystals, but still we have a solution of copper sulfate present. Water cannot be purified by this method. So we can remove some of the crystals and water is still in solution form. So this separation method is wrong. Part B, ethanol and water, both are miscible with each other and they can be separated by distillation procedure. Evaporation is incorrect as both will evaporate. Part C is salt and sand. Both are solid and this is a mixture. And solid mixture first must be dissolved in water, then we should filter and then we should evaporate to dryness. Only filtration is not enough. Part D is nitrogen and oxygen, both are gases, both have different boiling points, so we can separate them on the basis of their boiling points which is called fractional distillation. And pure nitrogen and pure oxygen will be obtained by this process. Therefore, correct answer is part D. Question 4. An aqueous solution of J is a colorless solution that contains cations and chloride ions. Separate samples of the solution give a white precipitate with few drops of aqueous sodium hydroxide and with few drops of aqueous ammonia. Which statement about J is correct? As solution of J is colorless solution, it means it is not transition element because transition element form colored solutions as iron plus 2 is transition so therefore 
it is not B. Part A, the cation in J must be aluminum plus 3. Now from the table of cations, we can see that aluminum plus 3, lead plus 2, and zinc plus 2. All these three can give white precipitate with few drops of sodium hydroxide, aqueous, and also white precipitate with few drops of aqueous ammonia. So we can say that the cation could be of aluminum plus 3, lead plus 2, or zinc plus 2. We cannot say that it must be aluminum plus 3. Part C, when dilute nitric acid and aqueous barium nitrate are added to an aqueous solution of J, a white precipitate is formed. As we have chloride ions present in J, so we can write the reaction. We have barium nitrate, we have nitric acid, we have chloride ions. Now this barium can react with chloride to form barium chloride and this is a soluble solution, it is not a white precipitate. So C is also incorrect. Or D, when dilute nitric acid and aqueous silver nitrate are added to an aqueous solution of J, a white precipitate is formed. Again we can write the equation, we have silver nitrate, AgNO3, nitric acid, HNO3, we have chloride ions, now silver ions can react with chloride ions to form white precipitate of silver chloride which is insoluble. Correct answer is therefore part D. Question 5. Gas X has the following properties. First is that it is colorless. Then it has no effect on either damp red or blue litmus papers. Third is no effect on lime water. Fourth is that it is flammable. What is gas X? In part A we have ammonia. Now ammonia is a colorless gas. So part 1 is correct for ammonia. Second is that ammonia can change red litmus paper to blue. So therefore second part is wrong for ammonia as ammonia is basic gas. We are going to move to part B. We have chlorine. Chlorine is not colorless. It is greenish yellow. So chlorine is also incorrect. Part C is hydrogen. Hydrogen is a colorless gas. So part 1 is true for hydrogen. It has no effect on red or blue litmus paper because it is neutral gas. So part 2 is also correct. Third is that it has no effect on lime water. This is also true for hydrogen. Fourth is that it is highly flammable gas. So all four options are correct for hydrogen. Part D is oxygen. Oxygen is colorless. It has no effect on litmus papers, no effect on lime water, but oxygen is not flammable. It only helps in burning. So all four options are correct for part C, which is hydrogen gas. Question 6. Which statement about states of matter is correct? Part A. When liquid freezes, it becomes solid and energy is released to the surroundings. This is true because from liquid to solid, energy is lost as kinetic energy reduces. Part B. When liquid reaches its boiling point, it becomes a gas. This process is called evaporation. It is not evaporation, it is called boiling. Part C, when a solid changes directly to gas, the process is called sublimation. It is not condensation. Part D, when a solid melts, the particles get further apart and have more energy. This is because kinetic energy is increased. 
as first option is correct answer is a question 7 use the periodic table to answer this question which two particles have the same number of electrons from periodic table we can find the number of protons for argon it is 18 for calcium it is 20 atomic number sodium is 11 potassium is 19 iron is 26 calcium is 20 scandium is 21 now finding electrons in neutral atom number of proton is equal to the number of electrons so 18 electrons in argon 20 electrons are in calcium they are not the same in positive ions electrons are lost as in sodium we have plus 1 it means 1 electron is lost so 11 minus 1 10 electrons are left Similarly, in potassium positive, one electron is lost, so 19 minus 1 becomes 18 electrons. In iron plus 2, 2 electrons are lost, so 26 minus 2, 24 electrons are left. In iron plus 3, 3 electrons are lost, so 26 minus 3 becomes 23 electrons. Still not equal. In calcium plus 2, 2 electrons are lost, so 20 minus 2 becomes 18 electrons. Scandium plus 3, 3 electrons are lost, so 21 minus 3 becomes 18 electrons. So electrons are equal in these two ions, therefore answer is D. Question 8. The table shows data for particles W, X, Y and Z. We have proton number, nuclear number, number of electrons. Which statements are correct? First one is that W and X are isotopes of the same element. Now isotopes have same protons, different neutrons or different nucleons. Let's see. W has 6 protons. X also has 6 protons. So we have same number of protons and different number of nucleons so therefore statement 1 is correct in 2 y is in group 5 of the periodic table in y we can see we have proton number 7 and electrons are also 7 in first shell we have 2 electrons in second shell we have 5 electrons so from this outer shell we can find out the Group number as 5 electrons are uh, valence electrons, so group number is 5th. This statement is also true. 3. Z is a cation. Cation is the one having positive charge, so electrons are lost. In Z, we can see we have 8 protons and 10 electrons. It means 2 electrons are added. So Z becomes Z minus 2. It is not cation, it is anion. Option 1 and 2 are correct. Answer is therefore A. Question 9. Which dot and cross diagram correctly shows a molecule of ethene? Ethene is an alkene having double bond between two carbon atoms. We have CH2 double bond CH2. It means that two pairs of electrons are shared between these two carbon atoms. This is single pair, so it is incorrect. These are two pairs. This is correct. Again, this is one pair, which is wrong. These are two pairs, which is correct. Now second thing is that there must be two hydrogen atoms with first carbon and two hydrogen atoms with the second carbon. So we have two hydrogen atoms single bonded with first carbon, two hydrogen atoms single bonded with second carbon. So this one is correct. In part D we can see we have three hydrogen atoms connected with first carbon atom, three hydrogen atoms connected with second carbon atom. This is wrong. 
Correct answer is therefore B. Question 10. The names and formula of three nitrogen compounds are shown. We have ammonia NH3, hydrazine N2H4, hydroxylamine NH2OH. Which compound has the highest relative molecular mass MR and in which compound is the percentage by mass of hydrogen the greatest? First, we can find the molecular mass of N2H4 and NH2OH. We have two nitrogen atoms, so 14 into 2. We have 4 hydrogen atoms, so 1 into 4. It comes equal to 32. Then we have NH2OH, nitrogen is 14. We have 2 hydrogen atoms, 1 oxygen, 1 hydrogen. So the molecular mass is 33. So it is either C or D, which is the highest relative molecular mass. Now let's find the percentage by mass of hydrogen. We have NH3 and N2H4. We can use the formula percentage by mass of hydrogen. It is equal to the atomic mass of hydrogen into number of atoms of hydrogen. Divided by the molecular mass of compound. into 100. Let's put values. First one is NH3. Atomic mass of hydrogen is 1. NH3 number of atoms of hydrogen is 3. MR of NH3 is 14 for nitrogen, 3 for hydrogen, 17 in total. Into 100, it comes equal to 17.6%. Second one is N2H4, atomic mass of hydrogen is 1, number of hydrogen atoms is 4, MR of this compound is 32, it comes equal to 12.5%. So percentage by mass of hydrogen is greater in NH3 as compared to N2H4. Correct answer is part C. Question 11. The relative formula masses of four compounds are given. A student has a one gram sample of each compound. Which sample contains the highest number of moles of oxygen atoms? Mass in grams is given. Now we can find the number of moles of each compound using the formula. Number of moles is equal to mass in grams divided by molecular mass. Molecular mass is a given. So for aluminum oxide, we can find the number of moles. It will be equal to 1 divided by 102. And it comes equal to 0.0098 moles. Similarly, 1 divided by 80 for copper oxide. Number of moles is equal to 0 0.0125 moles. We can do this for the next two. 1 divided by 98. 0 0.0102 moles. And last one is nitric acid. 0.0159 moles. Now we can find the moles of oxygen atoms in each of the compound. First one is aluminum oxide and oxygen. In one mole of aluminum oxide, we have three moles of oxygen atoms. So we can write one mole for this, three moles for oxygen. This is because in formula, we have three oxygen atoms and two aluminum atoms. So in one mole of aluminum oxide, we have two moles of aluminum atoms and three moles of oxygen atoms. 
if one mole of aluminum oxide has three moles of oxygen then 0.0098 moles of aluminum oxide will have x moles of oxygen atoms by cross multiplying we can find the value of x so it is 0.0294 moles this is the moles of oxygen atom present in 1 gram of aluminum oxide similarly for copper oxide we can write the ratio one mole of copper oxide contains one mole of oxygen as in the formula we have one atom of oxygen so for 0.0125 moles of copper oxide we have x moles of oxygen by cross multiplying the number of moles of oxygen atoms is also similar similarly for sulfuric acid In the formula we have four oxygen atoms so therefore one mole of sulfuric acid has four moles of oxygen atoms so 0 0.0102 will be x cross multiplying it is equal to 0 0.0408 moles now the last one is nitric acid one mole of nitric acid has three moles of oxygen atoms so 0 0.0159 moles would have x moles it comes equal to 0.0476 moles among these we can see that highest value is this one therefore correct option is d Question 12 10 cm cube of propane is burned in 70 cm cube of oxygen in a closed container this is a balanced equation we have 1 mole of C3H8 that combined with 5 moles of oxygen to form 3 moles of CO2 and 4 moles of water what is the total volume of gas present after the reaction assume all volumes of gases are measured at room temperature and pressure we can write this equation we have C3H8 oxygen carbon dioxide and water now according to balanced equation we have one mole of c3h8 that combined with five moles of oxygen to form three moles of co2 and four moles of h2o as h2o is liquid so therefore we are going to leave this one out because in the question it says the total volume of gas present not the liquid now we can write the initial volumes present before the chemical reaction in the start we had 10 cm cube of propane so we can write 10 cm cube 70 cm cube of oxygen was present and there was no amount of product in the start of chemical reaction now according to the molar ratio we can also find the ratio of volume if one mole of c3h8 requires five moles of oxygen then one volume of c3h8 will require five volumes of oxygen gas so we have 10 cm cube of c3h8 so it would require 50 cm cube of oxygen gas according to this ratio 1 ratio 5 so 10 cm cube has reacted with 50 cm cube of oxygen and 20 cm cube of oxygen is left 
and as the molar ratio was 153 so we have 10 then for 5 we have 50 and then for 3 we must have 30 centimeter cube of oxygen that is formed so at the end of chemical reaction we have 0 centimeter cube of C3H8 as all of it has reacted we have 20 centimeter cube of oxygen that is left from 70 centimeter cube 50 centimeter cube has reacted and 30 centimeter cube of carbon dioxide is formed now in total we have 30 centimeter cube of carbon dioxide and 20 centimeter cube of oxygen left after the chemical reaction so 30 plus 20 it becomes 50 centimeter cube correct answer is therefore part b Question 13. When a mixture of sodium chloride and sodium hydrogen carbonate is heated, the reaction shown takes place. Sodium hydrogen carbonates convert into sodium carbonate, carbon dioxide and water. Sodium chloride is unchanged on heating. When 6 grams of the mixture is heated, the loss in mass is 1.5 grams. What is the percentage by mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate in the mixture? The molecular masses are given. We can rewrite this chemical equation. We can also write sodium hydrogen carbonate 2 moles and they decompose to form sodium carbonate and these two they can be written as H2CO3 which is carbonic acid gas. Now in the question it says loss in mass is 1.5 grams. Now we can see these two are gases so therefore this is the lost mass. Or we can also say this is the lost mass. So it is 1.5 grams that is lost. From this mass we can find out the number of moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate and then the mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate that was present. As the mole ratio is 2 ratio 1 we have 2 moles of NaHCO3 and 1 mole of this combined thing H2CO3. So the ratio is 2 into 1. Let's first convert this mass into number of moles. The formula is moles is equal to mass in grams divided by molecular mass. We have hydrogen 2 for carbon 12. For 3 oxygen it will be 16 into 3, 48. So 1.5 grams divided by the molecular mass which is 62. It comes equal to 0 0.0242 moles. These are the moles of this product that is lost. Now from this lost moles we can find the moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate reacted. As the ratio is 2 into 1. We can write NaHCO3. H2CO3. As initially we have 2 moles of NaHCO3 and 1 mole of H2CO3. Now we have this much moles of H2CO3 that are lost. So number of moles of NHCO3 reacted will be X. Let's find it by cross multiplication. So the number of moles of NHCO3 reacted is 0 0.0484 moles. Now we can convert this moles of NHCO3 back into the mass. Mass in grams is equal to moles into molecular mass. Number of moles is 0 0.0484. Molecular mass of NaHCO3 is given, which is it is 84. It comes equal to 4.064 grams. Now we can find the percentage by mass of NaHCO3 in the mixture. So percentage by mass is equal to mass of NaHCO3 divided by the mass of mixture which was the total mass into 100. 
mass of NHCO3 is 4.064 grams. Total mass given was 6 grams. It comes equal to 67.74%, which can be rounded off to two significant figures as 68%. Correct answer is therefore C. Question 14. Molten sodium chloride is electrolyzed. Which changes occur at the cathode? In molten sodium chloride, we have Na positive cations, Cl negative as anion. Now, at cathode, reduction takes place. You should remember red cat, which means reduction always occurs at cathode. Now, reduction is the gain of electrons and electrons are always gained by cations so sodium ions will gain electron and convert into sodium metal from plus one it goes into zero so therefore this is a reduction So in A, we have sodium ions are oxidized. In B, sodium ions are reduced. This is reduction as electrons are gained. Chloride ions are oxidized or reduced. Now chloride does not move towards the cathode. As it is anion, it will go to the anode. Correct answer is therefore B. Question 15. Which positive ions are present in aqueous copper 2 sulfate? We have aqueous copper 2 sulfate which means we have water. In water H plus and OH negative are present. In copper 2 sulfate we have copper plus 2 ions that are present. And sulfate ions are also present. Now the positive ions are H positive and copper plus 2. Therefore correct option is B. Question 16. Natural gas is used as a source of energy. What is the main compound in natural gas? Now natural gas is composed of methane, which is CH4. Ethane is C2H6. Ethene is C2H4. Methane is CH4. Methanol is alcohol, which is ch 3 O H. Correct option is part C. Question 17. Ethanol is produced by the fermentation of glucose from sugarcane. In some countries, ethanol is used as a fuel. Which statements are correct? 1. Sugarcane is a non-renewable or finite resource. As sugarcane is a crop, it can be grown again and again, so therefore it is not finite, it is a renewable resource. Option 2. When sugarcane is growing, it removes CO2 from atmosphere. This is true statement because as sugarcane is a green plant crop, so therefore photosynthesis takes place, which removes carbon dioxide and produces oxygen gas. As only second statement is correct, so therefore answer is B. Question 18. Aqueous sodium thiosulfate reacts with hydrochloric acid. The rate of reaction increases if the concentration of both reactants is increased. Nitrogen gas reacts with hydrogen gas. The rate of reaction increases if the pressure in the reaction vessel is increased. Which row correctly explains why the given change increases the rate of the reaction. 
first is aqueous sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid as the concentration is increased it means that the number of molecules of the reactants are increased so when number of molecules increase and there is more frequency of collisions between particles or in other words more successful collision will take place and more product will be formed the activation energy is not affected by concentration it can be changed by catalyst only on second part we have nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas in gases when pressure is increased what happens that the molecules come close together and when molecules come close together there are more chances of successful collision so again we can say that there is higher frequency of collisions between particles again the activation energy does not depend on the pressure it can only be reduced by catalyst correct option is therefore a Question 19 magnesium reacts with dilute sulfuric acid the reaction is given magnesium forms magnesium sulfate along with hydrogen gas two experiments are carried out at 25 degrees centigrade the temperature is same for both in first experiment we have 24 grams of powdered magnesium again in second we have 24 grams of powdered magnesium reacted with 100 cm cube of 1 mole per decimeter cube sulfuric acid and second one we have 50 cm cube of 2 mole per decimeter cube sulfuric acid during each experiment the volume of hydrogen is measured the results are plotted on a graph which graph is correct we can see we have volume of hydrogen on y axis and time on x axis and the graph shows the reaction rate this is experiment 1 which shows straight line and experiment 2 is shown by dotted line as in the equation we can see that one mole of magnesium it reacts with one mole of sulfuric acid to form one mole of magnesium sulfate and one mole of hydrogen gas as in both experiments the mass of magnesium is same so therefore number of moles of magnesium are same in both the experiment 1 and experiment 2 let's find the number of moles of sulfuric acid in first experiment and in second experiment we can use the formula number of moles is equal to concentration in mole per decimeter cube multiplied by volume in decimeter cube now volume is given in centimeter cube this can be converted into decimeter cube by dividing by 1000 similarly this one so this one comes equal to 0.1 decimeter cube and this one comes equal to 0.05 decimeter cube using formula we can find the number of moles in first one number of moles is equal to concentration which is 1 into volume which is 0.1 so number of moles are 0.1 moles in second one we have concentration equals to 2 volume equals 0.05 so number of moles come equal to 0.1 moles now we can see that the number of moles of sulfuric acid are same in both experiment so as number of moles of magnesium and sulfuric acid are same the number of moles of hydrogen formed will also be same in both experiments so from the graphs we can see that in experiment 1 and 2 the number of moles are same so volume is same in part c we can see that the volume is different which is incorrect again indeed the volume given is different which is wrong second thing is the steepness of reaction now the steepness depends on the rate of chemical reaction this one represents slower rate and this one represents faster rate let's see which experiment is faster and which one is slower in experiment 1 we have powdered magnesium in experiment 2 we also have powdered magnesium and concentration is same as the amount is same but on dilute sulfuric acid side we can see that the concentration is 1 mole per decimeter cube while in second experiment the concentration is 2 moles per decimeter cube now rate of reaction does depend on the concentration higher the concentration faster will be the rate of chemical reaction so therefore the reaction rate will be faster in experiment 2 as compared to experiment 1 
This shows experiment 2, so therefore this must be faster than experiment 1. It is not slower, therefore correct option is part A. Question 20. Solution X is colorless. A few drops of aqueous potassium iodide solution are added to sample of X. No change is seen. Solution Y is colorless. Few drops of aqueous acidified potassium manganate 7 solution are added to sample of Y. The color of potassium manganate disappears. What can be deduced about X and Y from these two observations? You have to find out whether it is reducing agent or oxidizing agent. Potassium iodide is reducing agent. Potassium manganate is oxidizing agent. Now as we can see that X is not reduced by this reducing agent. So therefore we can say that X is not oxidizing agent. You can also say that X may or may not be a reducing agent. This is because reducing agent cannot react with another reducing agent or X may also be unreactive substance which is neither reacts with oxidizing agent nor reducing agent. Now in second reaction we can see that KMnO4 has changed the color of solution Y. So as potassium manganate is oxidizing agent so therefore solution Y must be reducing agent. Moving towards option, in option A it says X and Y are both reducing agents. Now X may or may not be a reducing agent and Y is a reducing agent. Therefore for X we are not sure whether it is a reducing agent or it is unreactive substance. Part B, X is an oxidizing agent. X is not oxidizing agent so this is incorrect. Part C, X is not a reducing agent. It might be true. Or might not be true. Y is an oxidizing agent. This is incorrect because Y is reducing agent. Part D, X is not an oxidizing agent. This is true statement. Y is a reducing agent. This is also a true statement. So therefore we can say that answer is D. Question 21. Brown nitrogen dioxide reacts to form colorless dinitrogen tetraoxide in a reversible reaction. The forward reaction is exothermic. Which changes would make the equilibrium mixture darker in color? Now this side is brown so therefore this side is darker. This side is colorless so we can say it is lighter in color. Overall the reaction is exothermic. It means enthalpy change is negative. For exothermic temperature as heat is released, so heat is the product, if we are going to increase the temperature of that reaction, the reaction will move in the backward direction. So it will become more darker. So increase in temperature will lead to a darker chemical reaction. For pressure we can count the number of moles. We have two moles on the reactant side, one mole on the product side. So at higher pressure it will move from more number of moles to less number of moles. At lower pressure, it will move from less number of moles to greater number of moles. So therefore, pressure should be decreased in order to make it darker. Correct answer is therefore C.
Question 22 which row shows the pH values for 0.1 mole per decimeter cube solutions of ammonia, hydrochloric acid, sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide. Ammonia is alkali as it can dissolve in water to form ammonium hydroxide. HCl is acid as it forms H positive ions and Cl negative ions. NaCl is neutral salt and sodium hydroxide is strong alkali. As compared to ammonia, it is stronger. So we can say that as NaCl is neutral, its pH will be 7. As 7 pH represents neutral, alkali is strong, so therefore its pH should be 13, not 1. Acid is a strong acid, HCl is a strong acid, so therefore its pH will be nearer to the 0. It should be 1, not 11. And ammonia is an alkali, so therefore its pH should be 11. As it is less strong as compared to NaOH, so therefore it cannot be 13. Correct answer is part C. Question 23. Four test tubes are set up as shown. We have silver nitrate, copper nitrate, lead nitrate and sodium nitrate. What is the effect of adding dilute hydrochloric acid to each test tube? We have to find out whether clear solution is formed or a precipitate is formed. In hydrochloric acid, we have H plus and Cl negative ions. In silver nitrate, we have Ag positive. It can react with Cl negative from HCl to form white precipitate of silver chloride. In copper nitrate, we have copper plus 2. It can react with chloride to form soluble copper chloride, so no precipitate is formed. In lead nitrate, we have lead plus 2. It can react with Cl negative to form white precipitate of lead chloride, insoluble. In sodium nitrate, we have sodium ions. Cl negative from HCl, it will form soluble NaCl. So precipitate is formed in W and why? In X and Z, no precipitate is formed. Correct answer is therefore B. Question 24. Aqueous ammonia reacts with the compound to form a salt, ammonium phosphate. What type of reaction will ammonia undergo to form ammonium phosphate? Ammonium phosphate is a salt. Aqueous ammonia, ammonia when dissolved in water. It can form ammonium hydroxide. Ammonium hydroxide is soluble so it will form ammonium ions and hydroxide ions. Now we can react ammonium hydroxide with phosphoric acid to form ammonium phosphate. It will form salt, ammonium phosphate. along with water. This type of reaction is neutralization because alkali and acid react together to form salt and water. Correct option is therefore B. Question 25. Sulfuric acid is manufactured in the contact process. Several substances are involved in the process including vanadium 5 oxide and water. Which roles are played by vanadium 5 oxide and water in the contact process? 
In contact process, what happens is that sulfur is combusted in the presence of oxygen to form sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is then oxidized in the presence of oxygen to form sulfur trioxide and it is a reversible reaction. To form greater product catalyst is added which is vanadium pentaoxide B2. O5 and about 450 degree centigrade of temperature is used. Then this sulfur trioxide that is formed, it is dissolved in sulfuric acid to form oleum H2S2O7. And this oleum is then diluted in the presence of water to form sulfuric acid. So vanadium pentaoxide is used as catalyst while water is used as a reactant. The equation for water would be like this H2S2O7 plus we have water. It will form two moles of H2SO4 in balanced equation. Correct answer is part A. Question 26. Some properties which indicate the differences in elements are listed. We have metallic character, number of electron shells in an atom, number of protons in an atom, total number of electrons in an atom. Which two properties increase across a period of the periodic table? In periodic table group 1, 2 and 3 consists of metals, while group 6 7 and 8 consists of pure nonmetals, so therefore metallic character decreases along the period. So it does not increase. Second is the number of electron shells in an atom. As in a period, the number of electron shells are fixed. For example, in third period, we have sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon phosphorus, sulfur, all these elements present in the third period of the periodic table have three shells. For example, the atomic number of sodium is 11, two electrons are present in first shell, eight electrons are present in second shell, one electron is present in third shell. So we have three shells. For magnesium, the atomic number is 12. Two electrons are present in first shell, then we have eight electrons, and then we have two electrons. So again, three shells are present. Number of shells remain constant. Third is the number of protons in an atom. In sodium, we have 11 protons, then we have 12 in magnesium, 13 in aluminum, 14 in silicon, 15 in phosphorus, and so on. So therefore, number of protons do increase across the period. Four is the total number of electrons in an atom. Now, as the number of protons increase, the number of electrons also increase because in neutral elements, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. Option 3 and 4 are correct. Answer is therefore D. Question 27. Germanium is in group 4 of the periodic table. It has proton number of 32. Selenium is in group 6 of the periodic table. It has proton number 34. Which prediction can be made based on the positions of germanium and selenium in the periodic table? Part A. A germanium atom has two more valence electrons than a selenium atom. Now valence electrons can be found from group number. Germanium is in group 4 so it has four valence electrons. Valence electrons means the electrons present in the outermost shell. Similarly, selenium is in group 6, so it has 6 valence electrons. So, selenium has 2 more electrons as compared to germanium. This is wrong.
Part B germanium forms a GE plus 3 ion and selenium forms an SE minus 3 ion. Now, this depends on the outermost shell. Germanium has 4 electrons in the valence shell, so it can lose 4 electrons to form GE plus 4. Selenium is in group 6, so it will gain 2 electrons to complete its octet, so it will form SE minus 2. Part C germanium has more metallic character than selenium. Now, moving across the periodic table, metallic character decreases. We have metals in group 1 and 2, and we have non metals at the end of periodic table. As selenium is in group 6, so therefore selenium has less metallic character than germanium, so therefore this is true statement. Part D, germanium has similar properties to tellurium and selenium has similar properties to tin. Now germanium is a metalloid. Tellurium is also a metalloid. So both has similar properties. Selenium is a non-metal. While tin is a metal. Therefore, the properties of tin and selenium are not similar. Correct answer is therefore part C. Question 28. The proton number of cesium is 55. Compared with lithium, the melting point of cesium is dash and the reaction of cesium with water is how much bigger is? The number of valence electrons in cesium is as compared to lithium. You have to complete the gaps 1, 2 and 3. Now lithium and cesium both are present in group 1 of the periodic table. Cesium is below lithium so both must have the same number of electrons in outermost shell or same valence electrons which is 1 each. So we have same valence electrons. Going down the group in group 1, the reactivity increases. This is because loss of electrons become easy. So cesium is more reactive as compared to lithium. So cesium with water is more vigorous as compared to lithium. Third thing is the melting point. Moving down in group 1, the melting point decreases. This is because moving down in the group, the atomic size increases, so therefore the hold on electrons decrease, so overall melting point will also decrease. So melting point of cesium will be less as compared to lithium. Correct answer is therefore D. Question 29. Nickel is a transition element. Which properties does it have? First one is that it can act as a catalyst. This is a true statement because transition metals can be used as catalyst. And nickel is used as a catalyst in hydrogenation of alkenes. Second is that it conducts electricity when molten. As nickel is a metal, metals are good conductors in solid and molten state, so this is also true. 3. It forms colored compounds. As nickel is a transition element, so this is a property of transition metals that they form colored compounds. Part 4. It has only one oxidation state. This is not true because transition elements have variable oxidation states. As first three options are correct, Answer is A. Question 30. Which metal reacts with steam and can be extracted from its ore by reduction with carbon? 
we can write the reactivity series we have potassium sodium calcium magnesium then we have zinc iron lead copper and silver in this reactivity series carbon is between magnesium and zinc so elements below zinc can be reduced by carbon because they are less reactive so we have magnesium it cannot be reduced as it is above carbon calcium is also above carbon copper is below carbon zinc is also below carbon second thing is the reaction with steam now copper does not react with steam there is no reaction as copper is unreactive zinc can react with water in the form of steam to form oxide and hydrogen gas correct answer is therefore d question 31 three correct statements about aluminum are listed first one is that aluminum is the most common metal in earth crust second it is costly to extract aluminum from its ore bauxite third is that the world supply of bauxite is limited which statement explain why aluminum should be recycled as all three statements are correct so let's find out the one that is responsible for recycling first one is that aluminum is the most common metal it means it is quite abundant so when something is abundant it means that there is no need for recycling second thing is the cost as it is costly to extract aluminum so therefore aluminum must be recycled to reduce the cost third is that the world supply of bauxite is limited now due to the limited supply of this ore aluminum must be recycled correct statement are 2 and 3 therefore answer is b question 32 attaching pieces of magnesium to underground iron pipes can protect the iron from corrosion which reaction protects the iron from corrosion from the reactivity series we can see that magnesium is more reactive than iron in metals more reactive means which can easily lose electrons so magnesium will easily lose electrons as compared to iron it will form magnesium plus 2 along with two electrons so oxidation of metal will occur now we have oxidation in part b which is oxidation of iron this will not occur until magnesium is present as this is sacrificial protection so as long as magnesium is present iron will not be oxidized only magnesium will be oxidized and it will form magnesium plus 2 along with the loss of two electrons so correct option is part d Question 33 iron is extracted from its ore hematite in a blast furnace which statement about this extraction process is correct first thing is that air is blown into the blast furnace to react with carbon this is true statement because carbon reacts with oxygen in air to form carbon dioxide part b at the bottom of a blast furnace a layer of molten iron floats on top of a layer of molten slag now the density of iron is more than the density of slag so therefore iron does not float it is slag that floats part c limestone is decomposed in the blast furnace to produce carbon monoxide this is incorrect because limestone consists of calcium carbonate which can be decomposed at higher temperature to form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide part d silicon dioxide an impurity in the ore is basic oxide now silicon is a non metal 
and its oxide is acidic in nature, it is not basic. Correct option is therefore A. Question 34, which statement about the preparation and properties of aluminum is correct? Part A, aluminum is obtained by heating aluminum oxide with carbon. This is incorrect statement because aluminum is very reactive and it can only be reduced by electrolysis. Part B, aluminum is produced at the anode by electrolysis of aluminum oxide dissolved in molten cryolite. Now aluminum is a cation, aluminum plus 3 and cation moves towards cathode. It does not move towards anode. At cathode it will gain electrons to form aluminum metal. So it is not the anode, it is the cathode. Part C, aluminum is unreactive as it forms an oxide coating. Now this is true statement because aluminum forms aluminum oxide coating which makes it unreactive. Part D, aluminum is used in overhead electricity cables as it is a good conductor of electricity and has higher density. Now second thing is wrong because aluminum has lower density that is why it is used in overhead electricity cables. Correct answer is therefore part C. Question 35. How many moles of hydrogen chloride are formed when one mole of methane reacts with large excess of chlorine in sunlight? This is a free radical reaction in which hydrogen atoms from methane they are replaced by chlorine atoms. The chlorine atom replaces hydrogen atom and this hydrogen atom converts into HCl upon reaction with other chlorine. So now this hydrogen is replaced by this chlorine and HCl is formed as the product. When chlorine is in excess, then all hydrogen atoms will be converted into chlorine atoms. So for that we can write the chemical equation, we have CH4, methane, chlorine, all hydrogen replaced by chlorine, so it will form CCl4 along with HCl. Now we can balance this equation, we have 4 hydrogen, so we can write 4 with HCl. Now we have 8 chlorine on the product side, so we can write 4 with Cl. From balanced equation, we can see that one mole of CH4 it reacts with excess chlorine to form four moles of HCl. Correct answer is four moles. Question 36. Vegetable oils can be made into margarine. Which row describes the change which takes place? Now vegetable oils are unsaturated hydrocarbons that contains carbon-carbon double bond. Now these unsaturated compounds are then converted into margarine which is saturated solid and contains carbon-carbon single bonds. Now unsaturated hydrocarbons can be converted into saturated hydrocarbons by hydrogenation. Hydrogen attaches itself with the double bonded carbon atoms and single bond is formed. Double bond converts into single covalent bond. So hydrogen is added and as margarine is solid while oils are liquid, so therefore viscosity increases. Correct option is part A.
क्वेश्चन थर्टी सेवन विच स्टेटमेंट अबाउट एल्कोहल्स आर करेक्ट वन ऑल एल्कोहल्स कंटेन द हाइड्रोक्साइड आई ऑन ओ एच नेगेटिव दिस इज इन करेक्ट बिकॉज ओ एच नेगेटिव इज प्रेजेंट इन एल्कलीज फॉर एग्जाम्पल एन ए ओ एच विच डिजोल्व टू फॉर्म एन ए पॉजिटिव एंड ओ एच नेगेटिव एल्कोहल्स डू नॉट डिसोसिएट टू फॉर्म हाइड्रोक्साइड आयोन्स पार्ट टू एथेनॉल कैन बी फॉर्म फ्रॉम ethene using a reaction catalyzed by yeast now ethene can be reacted with steam in the presence of phosphoric acid at 300 degree centigrade and 660 atmosphere pressure to form ethanol no yeast is used so therefore this is wrong part 3 methanol can be oxidized to methanoic acid methanol is an alcohol containing one carbon atom methanoic acid is carboxylic acid consisting of one carbon atom so as alcohol can be oxidized we can write this ch3oh this is one carbon alcohol which is methanol it can be oxidized in the presence of potassium dichromate along with heat to form methanoic acid which is hcoh along with water so this is a true statement part 4 the alcohols x and y shown are isomers isomers means having same formula but different structures in first one we can see we have four carbon atoms so it is c4 we have 10 hydrogen atoms one oxygen atom and oh is connected with second carbon in y we can see we have four carbon atoms 10 hydrogen atoms one oxygen atom and in this one oh is connected with the first carbon atom so as we can see that the formula is same structures are different so therefore this one is also true correct answer is part d Question thirty-eight: Which circled structure shows only the functional group of carboxylic acid? Now, functional group of carboxylic acid is C double bond O O H or C double O H. In the first structure, we have C H three also present in the circle, so therefore this is wrong. In second circle, there is only C double bond O O H, so therefore this is correct. In third, we have only OH, which represents alcohol, so this is also wrong. In part D, we have C double bond OO, which represents ester linkage. Correct answer is part B. Question thirty-nine: Which statement about polymers is correct? Part A: Nylon and terylene are both polyesters. Now this is incorrect because in nylon we have amide linkage. So therefore, nylon is polyamide. While for terylene, this statement is correct because in terylene we have ester linkage. so terylene is polyester part b proteins and nylon have the same monomer units now proteins are made up of amino acids while nylon can be formed from one six di amino hexane 
and hexane dioic acid. So monomers are different for proteins and nylon. This is incorrect. Part C proteins have the same amide linkages as nylon. This is true statement because in proteins we have amide linkage, C double bond O, N H. In nylon we also have amide linkage, C double bond O, N H. Part D terylene and fats are esters but with different linkages. In terylene, we have ester linkage. In fats, we also have ester linkages. So as the linkage is same, so therefore this statement is wrong. Correct answer is part C. Question 40, some information about compound X is given. X contains the elements carbon, hydrogen and oxygen only. The product of the hydrolysis of X is simple sugar, glucose. What is X? A is a polyester. The linkage present in polyester is C double bond O, O. B is a protein. The linkage present in proteins is C double bond O and H. So nitrogen is also present in protein. C is nylon. The linkage present in nylon is similar to that of protein. Nitrogen is also a part, so therefore this is also wrong. D is starch. We have oxygen as the linkage in starch. Now let's do the hydrolysis. Polyester, it can be hydrolyzed to form carboxylic acid and alcohol. Because carboxylic acid and alcohol they combine together to form polyester. Now the product of hydrolysis must be simple sugar which is glucose. So therefore A is also incorrect. Now moving towards part D we have starch. Starch can be hydrolyzed to form simple sugar called glucose. Correct answer is part D. Thanks for watching. A like, comment and subscribe will be highly appreciated. You can find related videos and playlists. Stay happy and enjoy learning.